Okay, let's try and go through all of the chemistry that you need to know for GCSE Chemistry Paper 1. And we're going to be covering atoms, bonding, quantitative chemistry, chemical changes, and energy changes down below. Don't forget you can download the PDF version of this from scienceshorts.net, link in description. And I genuinely think that this is the hardest paper because there is so much stuff you need to know for it. Not only that, some of the questions you have involve quite a bit of tricky maths. So don't forget that it's not enough just to learn all this stuff. The best way of getting good at GCSE Science is actually having a go at questions. Okay, let's start off with the basics. What is an atom? An atom is something that can't be broken down or split into its constituents or smaller bits by chemical means. Yes, we do add or remove electrons to make ions, but we're not changing the inner workings of the atom. A compound is two or more types of atoms chemically bonded together. A mixture of different types of atoms or compounds not chemically bonded together. There are a few ways that we can separate a mixture into its different substances. First one is chromatography. We have a bit of filter paper with a dot of the mixture about a centimeter above the water line. The filter paper is just dipped in the water. The water gets drawn up the paper due to what we call capillary action. And that drags particles of the mixture with it. And the particles that end up the highest on the paper are the lighter particles. If this is something like ink, then you'll see the different colors that the ink is made up of ending up at different heights on the paper. It's a good idea to draw a line where the dot was because that might disappear and a line where the water ends up at on the paper as well. But we need to do those in pencil because that's not going to be moved by the water. Bit of maths with this, we have something called the RF value. That stands for retention factor. We calculate it by doing how far the solute has gone up the paper. That's the ink in our case, divided by how far the solvent has gone, the water. Another one is filtration. This removes insoluble particles like sand from water. We just have filter paper in a funnel and we put the stuff in the top and then we let the water drip through. And then hopefully we should just be left with the sand in the filter paper. However, if this was salt water, you'd still end up with salt in the water at the bottom. That's because the salt is actually dissolved in the water. So how do we get rid of that? Well, what we do is distillation. This removes a solute from a solvent like salt from water. What we do is heat the mixture or the solution the water evaporates and then we recondense it using a condenser tube usually that's something that has cold water running around the outside and then the water gets collected in a beaker hopefully leaving just the salt behind in the flask okay what does an atom look like well we have bits in the middle that make up what we call the nucleus they are neutrons and protons and we have electrons orbiting around the outside protons have a charge of plus one electrons have a charge of minus one neutrons are neutral they don't have a charge atoms have to have the same number of protons as electrons so that means that they are neutral there's no overall charge that changes when they become ions of course if they lose electrons then they have become an ion and getting rid of a negative charge leaves you with a positive charge so ions technically are positive however at GCSE we also say that if an atom gains electrons it becomes a negative ion we'll see more of that as we go on so here's the periodic table of elements there are eight main columns one two and then the gap and then three four five six seven eight or zero the column or group tells you how many electrons are in the outer shell and that's basically the most important thing that we need to know about an element how many electrons in its outer shell what row they're in is called the period and that tells you how many shells of electrons it actually has you can see hydrogen and helium at the top as well hydrogen is it a metal is it a non-metal mm, it's a little bit iffy Hydrogen is a bit special, only needs two electrons in its outer shell to be full. In the middle, we have the transition metals. We're not really concerned with those triple people. You might need to know a couple of things. Basically, transition metals that are further down the table are heavier, obviously, and also they have higher melting points. Everything to the left of the staircase there is a metal, and a metal is an electron donator. So metals lose electrons when they bond to something else. To the right we have non-metals, we say they're electron acceptors. Group one is called the alkali metals. They get more reactive as you go down the group. And this is because the outer electron is further from the nucleus. So not as much energy is required to remove that electron from the atom. These react with water to make an alkali solution. That's why they're called the alkali metals. Group seven are what we call the halogens. They get less reactive as you go down the group. That's because as the outer shell is further from the nucleus, it's not as easy for the electron to be accepted onto it. Group eight or group zero are what we call the noble gases. Now to all intents and purposes, they do not react because they have a full outer shell. But in practice, we have to say they're very unreactive. It is possible for them to react, but it's very unusual. 
key is what everything on a chemical symbol represents. In my case, I've drawn helium, so capital H, little e. The bottom number is what we call the atomic number, and that tells you the number of protons in the nucleus. And yes, for an atom, we also know that's the same as the number of electrons. Mass number, on the other hand, at the top, is the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. So if you want to find the number of neutrons, then you need to take top number away from bottom number. Electrons fill shells like this, 2882. Now we only really care about the first 20 elements. So that takes us down to calcium. And that's because that's just before we hit the transition metals. It gets messy after that. So if we take something like chlorine, its atomic number is 17. That means it has 17 protons. That means it also has 17 electrons. So how are they arranged in the shells? Well, we know it's two in the first shell, eight in the second shell, we're up to 10. And so that means that we're gonna have seven in the outer shell to bring us up to 17. This is how we can draw it. It's very unusual for you to have to draw all of the shells around an atom. Generally, we just draw the outer shell. We can think of atoms wanting either a full or an empty outer shell, but never write want in your exam. So that means either having eight or zero. Okay, for hydrogen and helium, that's just two. So atoms get what they want by bonding to something else. And they can do this different ways. Metals achieve this generally by bonding to non-metals. And we call this ionic bonding. A metal will donate an electron or electrons. That means we've made a positive ion. Where is the electron gone? Well, it's gone to the non-metal and that becomes a negative ion. Overall, the charge must still be zero though. Let's take the example of magnesium chloride. Now magnesium is in group two. That means it has two electrons in its outer shell, so it has to lose two electrons to have an empty shell. So its ion is always Mg2+. Chlorine has to gain one electron because it's in group seven. So its ion is always Cl-. So if we make magnesium chloride, that means it's not just MgCl, but it's MgCl2, because we need two minuses to balance out the two plus. Here's how we draw a dot and cross diagram for ionic bonding. The metal on the left always has an empty shell, so just a circle around it. And then we put the charge at the top right. The non-metal on the other hand, well, we draw its electrons with, say, crosses, and then we add on the electron from the metal using a dot. Doesn't matter if they're the other way around. Of course, only one electron goes to one chlorine atom, but we have two of those, so we put a little two down the bottom right. These ions generally form lattices, that is, grids of ions and so we end up with crystals. Ionic compounds generally have high melting and boiling points. They're soluble in water. They can conduct electricity when they're molten or in solution, that means dissolved, because the ions are free to move in both cases. Covalent is when non-metals bond to other non-metals. Non-metals don't donate electrons, so all they can do is share them to get a full outer shell. And the number of electrons needed by a non-metal to get a full outer shell is equal to the number of covalent bonds it forms. So hydrogen only needs one electron, so it always makes one covalent bond. Carbon is in group four, so it needs four more electrons, so it makes four covalent bonds, and so on. Usually we end up with small molecules. We call this simple covalent bonding. Take something like methane, CH4. Here's the structural formula for it. We draw lines representing covalent bonds between atoms, and we can see that each hydrogen has one bond, carbon has four bonds around it. Here's the dot and cross diagram for it. All we do is draw the outer shell, I have drawn the one electron on each hydrogen in the bonds. And then, of course, carbon shares one electron with each of the hydrogens as well. There's a quick way of learning how to draw these, though. If you see a covalent bond in the structural formula, then you know that that's going to be a dot cross electron pair. Just make sure at the end, check are all of the shells full. Hydrogens have two in this case. Carbon has eight altogether. Yes, it's four. It just so happens that all the electrons are being used up in the bonds. That's not always the case. You might have some electrons left over. Let's take CO2. Oxygen has to make two bonds because it's in group six. Carbon has to make four again. So that means we have to have a double covalent bond between the carbons and the oxygens. So if you see a double bond, that means we're gonna have two pairs of dot cross in the double bonds. Giant covalent is basically when we have covalent bonds just carrying on and carrying on. We don't make small molecules, we end up making huge molecules. Take diamond, for example. Here we have carbons arranged in a sort of 3D triangle. The little wedge and dotted line just show that the carbon's coming out towards you and away from you. So we have this little pyramid or tetrahedron that repeats and repeats until we have just one giant molecule of carbons. And that's what a diamond on your ring is. Graphite is what we call another 
allotrope of carbon and we have these layers of hexagonally arranged carbons on top of each other. You might see that the carbons can only be bonded to three other carbons so that means they make three covalent bonds. Where's the fourth? Well the spare electrons, what we say are delocalized, they're sort of free to move, they're not actually on the atom. They exist between the layers and they form a kind of bond between the layers. It's a really weak bond though so that means that these layers can slide over each other. One layer of this we call graphene. Another allotrope of carbon is fullerene or Buckminster fullerene, also known as a buckyball. It's like a football. We have 60 carbons all joined together in a sphere. We can have nanotubes. If you can imagine a layer of graphene that's been folded over to make a tube, that's what it is. And these three allotropes on the right are generally used as lubricant because they can slide over each other very easily. I mean, graphite, you know, that's in your pencils. That's because the layers can slide off onto your piece of paper easily. Metallic bonding, not really much to say here. Atoms form a lattice. When this happens, the electrons become delocalized. So actually what we have is a bunch of ions in a lattice and they're surrounded by a sea of delocalized electrons. Now, because they're delocalized, they're free to move. And that's why metals can conduct electricity. Polymers are long chains that are formed by joining together lots of individual molecules known as monomers. If we have ethene, then the double bond in the middle can split, so that means that it's ready to bond to another one and another one and another one, and we end up with a long chain, and we call that polyethene or polythene. And it always has to have a double bond in, or what we say unsaturated, more on this in paper too. To make a polymer, that is to do polymerization, we need high pressure to force these molecules together and a catalyst. And you know that a catalyst reduces activation energy. Periodic table didn't come out of nowhere. John Dalton was the first one to put the elements in weight order. Yeah, he called them weight instead of mass. So Dalton didn't have a table, it was just a long list. Newlands then grouped elements together with similar properties. And he found out that every eighth element had similar properties. So we're starting to get there. And then it was finally Mendeleev who put the elements in columns and rows to make what we basically know as the periodic table today. Okay, moving on to chemical changes. There are a bunch of different things that can react. You need to know what they make. A metal and oxygen makes a metal oxide. We call this oxidation. A metal or a metal oxide, when it reacts with water, makes a metal hydroxide. That's an alkali and hydrogen gas. An acid and a metal hydroxide makes a salt and water. So here's an example of an acid and metal hydroxide. Let's take hydrochloric acid and sodium hydroxide. That makes the salt, sodium chloride, that's just your table salt, and water. This, incidentally, is a neutralization reaction. We're going to talk about more of that in a bit. So that's how you make things, but you can also break things down. You can break things down with thermal decomposition. Heat something up and it might just break. Let's take copper carbonate. You heat that enough and it makes copper oxide and carbon dioxide. Displacement reactions. This is when we have a compound with a metal in. But if a more reactive metal comes along, it'll muscle out the less reactive wimpy metal from the compound. Take potassium coming in contact with sodium chloride. Potassium is more reactive. Active, so it kicks it out to make potassium chloride and sodium is left out in the cold. We can use this to extract metals from ores. We can also use the idea of reactivity in sacrificial metals. We can put bits of a reactive metal on the outside of the hull of a boat so it will react with the water first, hopefully leaving the metal, probably the steel, in the hull intact. When iron reacts with oxygen or water, it makes iron oxide, that's rust. Other metals can react with oxygen as well, like aluminium to make aluminium oxide, copper to make copper oxide, that's green, that's why the Statue of Liberty looks green, it's copper underneath. But we still don't call those rust, rust is just for iron oxide. To get iron out of iron ore, we can use a blast furnace. We have coke, that's carbon. We react that with oxygen to make CO2, and then that will go on to make carbon monoxide. Carbon monoxide can be reacted with the iron carbonate to leave pure iron. Okay, let's go on to some quantitative chemistry. Mass is always conserved. That means that atoms are not created or destroyed in chemical reactions. Any chemical reaction we write down, we have to make sure it's balanced. So let's take zinc and hydrochloric acid. It makes zinc chloride and hydrogen. Now we only have one chlorine on the left, two on the right, so it's not currently balanced. Now we can't change the chemical makeup of these molecules, so we can't just put a little two after the HCl to make two chlorines. We have to put a number before the symbols to multiply these up, so it's a little puzzle. But the trick is to start with the complex molecules and then end on the elements. So we're going to end on the zinc or
for the hydrogen H2 here. So we know we need two chlorines, so we're going to put a two in front of the HCl. We now have two chlorines on the left, but we also now have two hydrogens on the left as well. Lo and behold, though, we have two hydrogens on the right as well. Therefore, the formula is now balanced. If there are more hydrogens on the left, then we would just multiply up the H2 on the right. Relative atomic mass or relative formula mass, well, we get that from the mass number of an element. And it's relative because we're dealing with what we call moles. Right, we have a dozen eggs. A mole is 6.02 times 10 to the 23 atoms or molecules. And we get moles by doing grams, that's the mass of something we have in grams, divided by rams. That's the relative atomic mass, so grams over rams. Moles equals grams over rams. Really useful equation to remember. So that means actually that the mass number of an atom actually tells you how many grams a mole of that stuff weighs. So a mole of carbon weighs 12 grams. If we want to get the ram, we should say relative formula mass actually for CO2, well we just add all the numbers up. So carbon is 12 plus two lots of 16 for the O2, that gives us 44. So one mole of carbon dioxide weighs 44 grams. And this is important when we're dealing with chemical reactions because, well, let's take the reaction on the left. If we use one mole of zinc in the reaction, we would need two moles of hydrochloric acid because we can see we have the two in front of it. And incidentally, if we had less than two moles of hydrochloric acid, that would mean the reaction would be incomplete. So the hydrochloric acid would be what we call the limiting reactant. There's not enough of it for the reaction to complete. Solution concentration, another thing that people find tricky. But let's just have a think about the unit. It's grams per decimeter cubed or moles per decimeter cubed. So it is just how much stuff do we have in a decimeter cubed. Now a decimeter cubed is the same as 1000 centimeters cubed or 1000 milliliters. If you have to convert from one to the other, just remember you will always end up with more centimeters cubed than decimeters cubed because centimeters cubed are smaller. So that means concentration is equal to grams or number of moles that we have divided by the volume of the water that we're dissolving it in. A couple of things for usually just triple percentage yield is how much stuff do we actually get out of a reaction compared to how much stuff could we get in a perfect world. So it's the mass of the product divided by the maximum theoretical mass we could get out. Reactions often don't complete and that goes especially for reversible reactions like the Harbour process. Atom economy looks similar but it's very different. This would still be in play even if we had 100% yield. It's the mass of desired products divided by the total mass of the reactants going in. So Let's take our equation above. If we wanted zinc chloride, then we do the mass of that. We can actually use the rams dividing by the mass or rams of all of the stuff going in. Molar gas constant. What's weird is that it doesn't actually matter what kind of gas you have. One mole of it always fills 24 decimeters cubed of volume. So if we want the volume of a gas, we just take the number of moles times it by 24. Moles are useful for comparing how much stuff we need compared to how much stuff we get out. So let's have a look at a typical question. How many kilograms of zinc chloride can be made from three kilograms of zinc? Well, what we do is go from the mass. We have three kilograms to the number of moles. So we do grams over rams actually it doesn't have to be grams so long as you're using the same units of mass it can stay as kilograms it can stay as tons whatever just as so long as you're consistent in the question so find out the number of moles of reactants then use that to find out the number of moles of product made so in our case we can see that if we have one mole of zinc going in we're going to have one mole of zinc chloride coming out it would be different if we said three kilograms of hydrochloric acid because we have that two before it and then finally you convert the number of moles of your product back into mass using the equation again similar idea is used for our neutralization reaction if we want to find out the concentration of a solution like an acid or an alkali then we can do a titration we have a burette and we always put acid in the burette not the alkali we have a fixed volume of the base or alkali in the beaker and uh, i should have drawn a conical flask to be perfectly honest you can measure that using a bulb or glass pipette we put a couple of drops of methyl orange indicator in the bottom what we do is a rough titer or a rough titration let the acid flow fairly quickly while swirling the flask at the bottom and then as soon as it turns pink then we know that it has been neutralized and we probably overshot it but that's why we do a rough tighter so once we've got a rough tighter then we go back and do it a little bit more slowly once we get to near what we know the value is then we slow it down by closing the tap and we let the acid just drip through drop by drop and after each drop we swirl the flask and see if it stays pink not only turns pink but it has to stay pink if it turns back to orange then it's not quite complete 
If the stoichiometry, that just means ratio of moles, is 1 to 1, in our case it is, where there's no numbers before the HCl or NaOH, that means for each mole of base that we have in the flask, that means however many moles of base we have in our beaker, then we've just used the same number of moles of acid to neutralize it. So then it's going to be just what we saw with our zinc chloride. Let's say that a concentration of our alkali is 0.1 moles per decimeter cubed. We calculate the number of moles that we actually had, then say that's the same number of moles for our acid, and then we can divide that by the volume of acid used to find out the concentration. Speaking of pH, it goes from 1 to 14, 1 being acidic, 14 being alkali, 7 being neutral. Now an acid is something that dissociates, that means separates, into its H plus ions and its negative ions. But an acid will always have H plus ions in it. A strong acid is one which dissociates very easily, so you have a high concentration of these H plus ions swimming around. A weak acid is one where they don't dissociate very easily. For an alkali, it's OH minus. It's a logarithmic scale, so that means that an acid that is one lower than another acid is actually 10 times stronger. But what does it actually mean? Well, if we have pH 2 and pH 1, that means that the pH 1 acid has a 10 times higher concentration of H plus ions than the pH 2 acid. Electrolysis. We can use electrolysis to separate chemicals from solution. Say brine, that's just salt water, that's sodium chloride in solution. We have carbon electrodes because we don't want them to react. When we have salt water, we basically have a mess of Na+, Cl-, H+, and OH- ions just swimming around in solution. They're dissociated, so they're free to move. When we attach these electrodes to a battery, we have a positive electrode, we call that the anode, and a negative electrode, we call that the cathode. The Cl- ions, well, opposites attract, so they will go to the anode, where they will be turned into chlorine gas. However, it's the H+, that goes to the cathode, and is turned into hydrogen gas. It's not the sodium that goes to the cathode. That's because sodium is more reactive than hydrogen, so sodium wants to stay in solution more than hydrogen, as it were. We can write an ionic or half equation for what's going on at each electrode. We know that H plus is a hydrogen that's lost its one electron. So if we have the H plus going to the cathode, which has lots of electrons to spare, then it will give the H plus an electron and it will be turned into just a normal atom. Hydrogen gas is H2. It's diatomic, like pretty much most gases, apart from noble gases. So that means to balance it, we have to have two 2H+, and we can put the state symbols in, aqueous, that means it's dissolved, plus two electrons goes to H2 gas. Incidentally, because they go towards the cathode, we call these cations. Positive ions in solution are called cations. Cl minus, however, we call it an anion because it moves to the anode. It has an extra electron, so it loses that electron. It gives it to the electrode. So therefore, we have two Cl minus aqueous goes to Cl2 gas plus two electrons. If you wrote two Cl minus, take away two electrons, goes to chlorine gas. That's also acceptable. And there are two things going on here, oxidation and reduction. And the mnemonic you need to remember is oil rig. Oxidation is loss, reduction is gain that is, of electrons. So, what's happening at the cathode to the hydrogen? Well, it's gaining electrons, so that is reduction. Chlorine is losing electrons, so that's oxidation. That's always the case. We always get oxidation at the anode and reduction at the cathode. We can also use electrolysis to purify metals, like copper. This time, our electrodes are actually made out of copper. Our anode, that's a positive electrode, is made up of our impure copper. The copper atoms, they lose electrons to turn into Cu2 plus ions, and they go swimming around in the copper sulfate electrolyte that they're dunked in, and they will then move to the cathode, where they will then be reduced and turned back into normal copper. So what happens, the impure copper electrode will decrease in size, and the cathode will increase in size. But it's only the copper that can go from one one to the other. All of the other impurities in the copper aren't soluble, so they just drop to the bottom, leaving us with pure copper on the cathode. Let's talk about energy changes. Energy is required to break covalent bonds, but we have the same amount being made or released when these bonds are made. Bonds need a very specific energy to break them. Like a carbon-hydrogen bond needs 413 kilojoules for every mole of these bonds broken. So therefore we have two main types of reactions when it comes to energy, exothermic and endothermic. 
exo sounds like explosion, so that means it gets hot. But what does that mean? Well, that means that more energy is released from the bonds being made than needed to break the bonds. So that means that we get net energy being released, so it gets hot. Here's what we call the reaction profile for an exothermic reaction. Here's the energy level of our reactants, but then we can see that the energy level of our products has gone down, and that's what people find a bit confusing. This energy is technically potential energy. They're falling this potential energy level, so that means that they actually give out energy in the form of kinetic energy or heat. But we do need something to get the reaction started, and that's what this hump is. That's our activation energy, that is from the reactants to the top of that hump. That's like a spark needed to get a fire going, because otherwise things would be catching fire all the time. Not good. The difference between the two energy levels is the net or resultant energy out in the form of heat. Endothermic, on the other hand, more energy is needed to break the bonds than is released from the bonds being made. That means it gets cold. We don't have as many of these, but we do get them. Reactants are down the bottom, but the products end up at the top. We have activation energy again. If you wanted to do a prac on this, well, we need to measure the energy released from a reaction, and it can be exo or endothermic. All we do is have a polystyrene cup with a lid with a thermometer through the top and the bubble of the thermometer in the solution that's gonna react. When we start the reaction, all we do is see what the starting temperature is and the end temperature and we measure that change in temperature then we use our specific heat capacity equation you probably know this more from physics energy or heat is equal to the mass times the SHC times the temperature change the mass is going to be the volume in centimeters cubed of the solution we can measure that with a measuring cylinder specific capacity of water is 4.2 and the temperature change we calculate by doing start temperature, take away final temperature, or vice versa, it doesn't really matter. You can get given bond energies and then get asked to calculate how much net energy is released or taken in by a reaction. So let's take, say, methane, CH4, reacting with oxygen, making carbon dioxide and water. Just your normal combustion equation. We need to balance it first of all, so that means we need two lots of O2 and two lots of H2O. So like we said, the bond energy of CH is 413, so we do four times 413, and then we add on two lots of, well, it's 498 kilojoules per mole for OO double bonds. Adding those up, we can see that we have 2,648 kilojoules per mole needed to break all of the covalent bonds. Let's have a look at the products. We have CO2, so that's two lots of CO double bonds, and they're 805 kilojoules per mole each. And then we have four lots of HO bonds, because we have two H2Os made here. So that's four times 464. You'll always be given these bond energies. Now you might see I've made a mistake here, but that means that we have 3,466 kilojoules per mole being released from these bonds being made. So one take away the other, 3,466 kilojoules per mole released, take away the 2,648 kilojoules per mole that's gone in to break the bonds, and that means we get a net energy released of 818 kilojoules per mole. So that means that if we have a mole of methane burning in oxygen, we will get 818 kilojoules out. Lastly, a couple of things for probably just triple. Cells or batteries work because metals that are in a solution of its own ions will ionize, say zinc in zinc sulfate. The difference in charge between the electrode and the solution is called the electrode potential. So what we do is have two pools of these as it were, zinc dunked in zinc sulfate, copper dunked in copper sulfate. The PD between those two electrodes, well, that's what will drive your car or your phone or whatever. But we have to have a salt bridge in between. That's so the zinc ions on the left can go towards it and the sulfate ions on the right can go towards it as well. They move to it and they get added onto the salt bridge. Fuel cells, not much to see here. Basically, we have two tanks, one containing hydrogen, one containing oxygen. We let them react very slowly, but when they do, they produce a voltage. Theoretically, the great thing about hydrogen fuel cells, they don't produce any greenhouse gases either. Well, technically water vapor is a greenhouse gas, but we tend to forget about that. It doesn't make any carbon dioxide. So that's it. If you think I've missed anything, then put it in the comment down below. I've also done these for different papers, so check those out before your exams as well. See you next time.